Section 4.3 is titled Riemann Sums and Definite Integrals. Um, the first thing we're going to take a look at is just what the definition of each of those topics are. And we've actually seen Riemann sums before. So we haven't called them that yet, but now we can refer to them that way. So we've got a function, and it's defined on a closed interval a, b. And delta is a partition. Okay, so we've had um, rectangles you guys have done in the last section, right, where we, did, we partitioned it into four you know, equal widths or six or eight or something like that. So that's what delta represents, is it's this breaking apart of the interval. And so the a equals x0 up to xn, which is equal to b, is the partition. It's just the broken apart piece. And in reality, that partition does not have to be equal widths. It doesn't have to be. Um, so it, it could actually be unequal widths. It's just that it's a lot easier to work with it concretely if they're equal widths. Um, x or delta x sub i is the width of the ith sub interval. That's why that's actually identified there as being sort of dependent upon i. It's because the uh, in interval widths do not have to match. If c sub i is any point in the ith interval, so we've done left end points, right end points, and midpoints, right? But this actually says it can be any point in between there. Any point in between there. Uh, then the sum from i equal 1 to n of f of c sub i delta x sub i, all that should look like what we've been doing in the last section, is called a Riemann sum of f for the partition delta. The sums that we did in section 4.2 are examples of Riemann sums, but they are very specific, pretty easy to work with examples. They're certainly not general examples. Okay, So this just said basically that all the things that we controlled in the last section, we controlled the left endpoint or the right endpoint. So we controlled the, the height. We controlled the width. All those things that we controlled, you don't actually have to control them. And if you don't control them, ev even if you don't control them, they have a name and they're called Riemann sums. Now, what we're going to do with this is um, we're going to do the next section, which is called a definite integral, the next, uh, not section, but the next slide. It says f is defined on a closed interval a, b. And the limit of the Riemann sums over the partitions, so the limit of the deltas are going to zero. In other words, those widths, no matter what they were to begin with, since we didn't really care what they were, are going to get infinitely small. They're going to get very, very small. So if we let those widths go to zero of this summation, then we have something that's called a definite integral. So this down here, this is that limit as these widths are going to zero of the height times the width, okay? And this is equal to this. We've seen this integral symbol before. What we haven't seen is letters on the top and the bottom. This is an A, this is a B. These limits, these letters A, B are called the lower limit and the upper limit of integration. So lower is just the one that's down lower, and the upper is just the one that's down, is, is up higher. Okay, that's all those are. They don't necessarily mean smaller and larger. That's important to realize. We'll see that as an example later on. Um, and this is called the definite integral. Now, I don't want you to think right now that there obviously is a relationship from what we did in 4.1 when you just did antiderivatives, right? Obviously, there must be a relationship. This is the same script S with the same DX on the end. But we're not actually defining how those two things are related right now, okay? That's next section. Section 4.4 is called the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus. Anytime somebody puts fundamental in the words, you know, it's important, very important. And that's what it's going to do, is it's going to relate the ideas from section 4.1 to this ideas right here in section 4.3, okay? So what all we're doing right now is we're still talking about these rectangles, we're still talking about these lower and upper limits where we have an end point on each side and what we're doing with them, and we're still looking at this as sort of somehow an area like we were doing with the rectangles before. All right, so a few other things before we can actually do some examples. Um, if you have a function that's continuous, if it is continuous, it is automatically integrable, okay? So as long as you have a continuous function, you can do this process. You can create these rectangles. You can let these widths go to zero. You can talk about this thing that's called the area under the curve, okay, if it's continuous. Now, just because it has an area under the curve doesn't mean it has to be continuous. There are things that we could create that aren't continuous that certainly would also be able to have an area under the curve. So imagine if you had a function where it had one jump in it, right? It's nice and smooth, whatever, and then we stop right here and we jump up here and then it's nice and smooth over here. Don't you think we could probably break it apart somehow and do two separate pieces? Yeah. So it isn't a requirement that it be continuous. Okay, that's not a requirement. But if it happens to be continuous, then you know you have this feature. Are you guys with me? It's kind of like saying, it's not a requirement that I be a mom in order for me to be a woman, correct? 
But if I am a mom, you know that I'm a woman. That's by definition. That's what we mean by the word mom, right? Is that it's someone who's a female and has children. So this is the same thing here. All right. The definite integral as an area of a region. So this is where we're kind of mixing these notations and these ideas together. If f is continuous and non-negative, so we're talking about graphs that are above the x-axis or maybe even on the x-axis because it says non-negative, um, and it's over this closed interval from a to b, then the area that we are getting from the graph down to the x-axis and from the vertical line at x equal a to the vertical line at x equal b is what we're calling the area under the curve. And it is this integral from a to b of f of x dx. This is the picture that we shaded in last time. Okay? And we're now giving it this name. We're giving it this name, integral. And it's a definite integral because it has this a and this b on the top and the bottom. Okay? So let's take a look at an example. And this example is um, 273 in your textbook. It's problem number 16. I'm going to sketch it on here. Um, and it is f of x equals x squared. And the graph itself, they actually show you in this number 16 as well, which is why I didn't just put that in there to begin with, is that they show you this image. And um, let me see, let me get a color shade with. Okay, so of course their pictures is cleaner and clearer and it doesn't look like it crossed over the line that I just, or the curve that I just did. Okay, so just pretend like I drew better than I did. Um, what they actually ask us to do is to simply set up the integral. They want us to set up something that looks like this for that context. We're not solving, we're not actually finding the area or anything, we're just setting up the notation. Are you guys with me? We're setting up notation. So the notation says I'm going to have an integral symbol, this antiderivative symbol. I need to know the lower and the upper limits. So when we're setting them up, we're going to do it lower is smaller and upper is larger because that's the most logical way to do that. So if we're moving from the left to the right, what is the lower limit of integration? Zero. Right? It's the x-axis, it's the origin, it's zero. And what is my upper limit of integration? It's two. So this is why the picture is necessary, right? Because we could use anything for any of these curves, generally speaking. And then, what do you think goes next? X squared. It's the function that we're dealing with. And finally, we would have dx. And that's really just as simple as it is. Just right there. You're done. Okay? You're just taking the graph and you're doing the interpretation of it in the notation. That's all it is. It would normally be... Oh, you mean the, um, the interval brackets. Yeah. yeah, exactly. That's the only difference. And you're, but you're, and you're using the antiderivative notation that we had from section one. Yes. Okay. Now, we're going to actually find a couple of these integrals. Again, not with calculus, though. The calculus part of doing this will come in section 4.4, four, promise. But the directions here say to sketch the region whose area is given by the definite integral. Then, use a geometric formula to evaluate the integral. I promise we're not going to do anything crazy geometry here. Okay, it's going to be very simple, basic. You're going to go, oh, that's a what you'll know. Okay, promise. So this shape, what in the world is the graph of this going to look like? A straight line. So no, you don't mean straight exactly. Do you mean horizontal or vertical? It's horizontal, right? This equation right here, as uninteresting as it is, is essentially saying f of x equals 4 or y equals 4, right? That's a horizontal line. So a horizontal line at y equal 4. Here it is. And I've got some limits of integration that I can work with, 0 and 3. So what does that tell me? Yeah, it tells me where I start and stop on the x-axis, right? So I'm going to start here at 0, and I'm going to stop over here at 3. So this tells me the vertical lines where I start and stop. So I'm going to start here, I'm going to stop here, and I'm supposed to be shading this till where? I mean, what's going to get shaded in? From, three, from a y equals 4, right, down to the x-axis. That's what definite integral is, is it's this piece of the graph.
What is it? It's a rectangle. How do you find the area of a rectangle? Length times width. What's the length? Three or four, whichever do you interpret it to be, right? One's three, one's four. It's three wide, four long, or four wide, three long. I guess I didn't write it on here. We had y equal four as our original equation. So this is four high, and it's not drawn to scale, it's three long. What's the area? Twelve. What's that? Okay. Is it simple enough, right? It's easy geometric formula. You guys with me? They're not doing, you're not going to even see a circle in here. That would be, that would be interesting. Um, you, I guess you could see a circle. You'd probably see a semicircle. You'd probably see a top half of a circle um, if you were doing an equation. I can't remember if there's more any of those in, the, in WebAssign, but that's a possibility, I suppose. Okay, let's look at another one. This one right here. What is this graph going to look like? It's a line. Tell me about the line. Okay, it's got a y-intercept of 4. And then what? Oops. Slope of 3. That's what I was looking for. You guys with me, right? Slope of 3, y-intercept 4, slope of 3. So it looks roughly something like this. Um, I've got my limits of integration that go from 0 to 2. Zero, of course, is the y-axis, right? The, the y equals zero, or x equals zero y-line. Um, and then two is over here somewhere. So if I were to draw my vertical line at each of those, I'd start here. Whoops. Try one more time. There we go. And I'd have one here. I'm going to shade inside of that shape. What is the shape? Okay, so I think you re probably rectangle and triangle, right? You can do rectangle, triangle, or you could use trapezoid. Um, so either one is fine. I'll show you how to do both just in case you see one or the other and you want to make sure you can do it both ways. It's not a difficult thing to do. So let's do the trapezoid first because that will involve me not having to mark up my diagram. So if I do trapezoid, does anybody remember the area of a trapezoid? It's one half, the two bases. What are the bases? Yeah, the top and the bottom, but in this case right here, it's, it's the ones that are the pink lines. It's the parallel parts. The bases are, what are the parts that are parallel. So this piece right here, which is four, I can see that one. We don't know what this piece is, but can we find it? Yeah. Sure, what would we have to do? Plug two into the equation. So if you plug two into the equation, three x plus four, how high are you? 10. This is at 10. So really what you do in the trapezoid formula is you're averaging the heights of the bases. How do you average something? Well, you add the two things together and divide by two. That's exactly what this is. This is a 1 half. This is one base, which is 4. The other base, which is 10. I've averaged the heights of the bases. And then I need to multiply by the height. And what's the height of this thing? It's 2, right? The height's actually this distance across the shape. All right, so what does this give me? 14. All right, so this would be a way to do it with a trapezoid, okay? Let me show you how to do it if you don't have a trapezoid. So if you, or not if you don't have one, but if you don't see that one, you can break this into a triangle and a rectangle, right? Sure. So the area of a triangle is one half base times height. Now it doesn't matter what you call the base, so we'll just use the horizontal as the base. This base would be two, correct? What would the height be? Six, and you have to do this same thing we did before in order to find that, right? You actually have to figure out what this is with two plugged in. So this would be six high plus, and then we need the area of this shape down here, and this is another rectangle, so we have length times width. I have two times four. Somebody tell me, does that equal 14? I think the first piece is six, the second one is eight. That's a 14. So good that we get the same answer both times. Very nice. Okay, so trapezoids, you could do that, right? Or squares and rectangles, and yes, you can, Anderson. <laughs> rectangles and triangles. Okay, a couple of special definite, definite integral, um, yeah, for lack of better terms, uh, properties. So the additive, oops, I guess I skipped one. All 
Are they out of order? I think I just have them out of order in here. Okay, that's fine. Um, no, I don't have it in here at all, do I? I skipped one. Okay, see, so this is what happens when you do this too late at night. Okay, so let me write this in here on the next slide over here. I'll use a blank slide. Oh, that's not what I want. I want that one. Okay. All right, there's a definition, two special definite integrals that you should be aware of, okay? So you've got the notes on your page, so I'll just abbreviate to write down the piece that you're missing. This one tells you if f of x, I'm sorry, if f is defined at x equals a, then if you have the integral from a to a of f of x dx, what do you think that one would equal? Zero. If I want the area under the curve where I start at A and I end at A, there is no area, right? Okay, so that's the first one. The second one, which is, I mean, this is, that one's almost trivial. The second one's actually helpful from time to time. It says that if I have the integral from B to A, get those in there in the right order of f of x dx, B to A, this is the same as the negation of the integral from A to b of f of x dx. So I mentioned earlier uh, this feature where I said it doesn't necessarily mean that the lower value is smaller and that the upper value is larger. But if we're going to set it up, we might as well set it up that way, right? I, mean, I made that comment. Um, the reality is if the numbers are sort of backwards, if the lower value is actually larger than the upper value, um, then we can switch them. Um, and it makes practical sense to do so, but if you do switch the limits of integration, you have to change the sign in front of the integral, okay? And we'll talk more about how that happens. Um, I think it'll probably be in the next section, um, so have no fear on that. But we're going to do an example with it um, in a moment here. All right, let me go back and get the last two definitional kinds of slides. Additive. What's that? Well, the, the problem is that the way that this is defined is it's the area from the curve down. So in a little while, we're not always going to have the curves always trapped above the x-axis. Sometimes they're actually below the x-axis. And so then funny things kind of happen, and we talk about the area in a little bit different fashion. So, yeah. All right, a couple of um, properties. Theorem 4.6, the additive interval property says... If f is integrable on three closed intervals from a to b to c, okay, so it goes from a to c and somehow a to b, sorry, and c is somewhere in between, then we could integrate from a to b by breaking it apart if we wanted to for some reason somewhere in between at c. And this is actually why it works okay to have that sort of one place where the graph jumped that I told you a minute ago about, right? is that I don't have to go from all the way from A to B. I could stop somewhere in the middle at C and break it up into these two different pieces that are both continuous instead. So, what's that? Is C to B um, Yeah, it should. I'm sorry. This should say C to B. Go ahead and fix that if you've already written that down. My apologies. So the image is that you've got something that looks like A to B. C is somewhere in between, and so if I were finding the curve, whether it's continuous or not, I could certainly find this area, and then I could add it to this area, and it would be the total area. And we all say, well, of course you can. It seems quite reasonable, right? And it does. It seems quite reasonable. One more set of properties. These properties tell what you do when you've got these curves that have... Um, some features that we've seen with limits before. And so it should, shouldn't surprise us that they show up here again because the definition of these integral things had limits in it, right? And we saw all these properties happen before. So this one says that if I have a constant times a function, and my apologies, there should be a dx there as well. I get to change lots of things with this slide presentation when I leave class. dx right here as well. That I can actually take the constant and pull it out in front. That's a property we had for limits property you have for derivatives as well. Right. This one down here says that if I have two functions added or subtracted and I want the integral, these two features, um, I, the sum of them or the difference of them, I could actually separate them and do their limit, do their uh, integrals first, and then I can combine them afterwards. And that's a feature that, again, it's kind of like when you do it with derivatives. You use it all the time and you don't even think about it being used. It's just something you do. Okay. Notice what you don't have. You don't have anything about multiplication or division. 
right? And we will dabble just a little bit with the multiplication and division of features in sections 4.4 and 4.5. Not a lot, but a little bit. But when you get to Calc 2, and a lot of you are going on, I know, to Calc 2, that's when you deal a lot more with the multiplication and division features, okay? All right, so let's do an example with these. Um, these are actual integrals. If you actually know how to calculate integrals, these are correct values, okay? But what they're wanting us to do in this problem is they're wanting us to, knowing these three values, use that and those definitions and theorems and properties from the previous couple of slides to rewrite this to use these features. We're not asked to do anything with geometry, and we're certainly not asked to do anything with calculus yet. All we're doing is rewriting this piece of information. So notice, for example, that on this right here, I've got addition and subtraction, right? So I can split this into three separate integrals. That's what the last theorems the last property on that theorem told us I could do. So I can separate this to be the integral from 2 to 4 of x cubed dx minus the integral of 3x, or you could put plus a negative 3, um, you know, put a plus there and a negative inside, that's fine too, dx from 2 to 4, plus the integral of 8 dx from 2 to 4. So I'm kind of separating steps out here. I'm about to do one more step, and you could combine these two together, the same single step. But all I used was that last property, right? I used this property here that says I can separate them, and I used it for three functions instead of just for two. Okay. Now, this piece right here looks exactly like something I already have. So I don't have to do anything to that. That's fine. But this piece does not. I need that three to be on the outside. So that's going to be something I'm going to do here in just a minute. The other thing is, this one doesn't look like that at all, but what's going on right there? There's a 1 right there, right? So I can pull this 8 out here just like I can pull the 3 out here, and it will leave just that 1 dx in there. So my last step, and again, you could have done both of these at the same time if you um, knew enough to see both of them at the same time, and you will now. Um, so you can pull the 3 out from 2 to 4 of x dx minus... 8, was it minus? I'm sorry, it's a plus. Plus 8 integral from 2 to 4 dx. And then this piece, this piece, and this piece are all the values that I was given. So the first one is 60 minus 3 times, what was the second one? 6 plus 8 times 2. So I need 60 minus 18 plus 16. What is it? 58. OK. One last example. And lo and behold, we'll get finished today. Look at that. I know you guys were hoping against that, but sorry to disappoint. All right, this one. I mean, I've got the addition and subtraction thing going on. I'm going to do that. But before I even get to there, something else is different about this one that didn't happen on the last one. Yeah, the limits of integration are in the wrong order, right? They don't match. And, and by wrong order, I mean they don't match. Not that there's really a right or wrong order. They just don't match the information that I was given. So the very first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite this with the 2 as the lower limit and the 4 as the upper limit and the x minus 7 inside and so forth. But there's something when I do that that I have to change. Yeah, I'm going to put a negative at the beginning. You can distribute the negative through if you want. I'm just going to leave the negative at the beginning because this is going to look like what I want it to look like in a minute anyway. Now, I've got an integral from 2 to 4 of x dx. And then I've got minus an integral from 2 to 4. Now, this would be 7 dx, right? But I'm going to put the 7 out here and the dx in here so that it actually matches what I want. Are you guys with me? If you want to distribute the negative on the outside through this so that we don't have all these negatives hanging out everywhere, that's fine. You can do that. Um, if you want to wait till the end and just change the sign on your answer, you can do that too. So I think I'll wait to the end on this one. Um, the first piece, I already know that one. What's the integral from 2 to 4 of x dx? 6, right? Minus 7. What's the integral from 2 to 4 of dx? 2. That's 14. So what's 6 minus 14? negative 8, and then I've got another negative on the outside, so this ends up being 
8. And again, you could do these in a different order. I did in a different order on my paper, actually, that I wrote down before I came to class. So either way. Any questions on this? Those of you who've had calculus before are just aching to not use the information they gave you in this problem, and I know that. Just hold tight for one more class period, and then you're going to be able to... Others of you are just going, I don't know what you're talking about. That's fine. Right now it's good to be in the dark because it means that you're going to try less um, difficult tasks that you don't need to do yet. Okay? So that's it for this one.